Good to see you, brother. I feel, I feel about as out of place as a piano at a Church of Christ convention after that. <laughs> it's good to be at uh, Mims and in Texas again. Uh, thank you, Pastor. I appreciate it. In fact, there's a guy sitting back here, Nathan. Are you, are you a member here, Nathan? No, sir. But you're going to walk the aisle tonight. Nathan came to my church in Jacksonville. Look at him. I, see, see him back there? See, Nathan? I led Santa Claus to Jesus. Back there. <laughs> see? It's good to be here. It's good to be with you folks. Ten years ago this Friday at about 530 in the morning, Dr. O.S. Hawkins and myself and Jack Pogue and the funeral director dressed and picked up the body of the preacher, Dr. Criswell, and we put him in the back of that hearse. Ten years ago this coming Friday, he stepped into glory. Uh, I had seven years at First Dallas, and I loved every one of them, and I loved the people there, and I loved Texas, and it's good to be back. It was a very balmy Saturday uh, morning, about 8.07, in paradise in Hawaii, exactly, almost exactly two years ago this month, when over every piece of electronic came a message uh, that literally stunned everybody in the islands of Hawaii, and when everyone else found out about it, stunned us as well. The missile, the, the message read this, there is an incoming missile, take cover immediately, this is not a drill. And for 38 minutes, all of those in the islands of Hawaii in the 50th state just knew that what everybody had thought might would happen or could possibly happen was that Kim Jong-il in North Korea had unleashed a nuclear weapon on the islands of Hawaii. They said that for 38 minutes, people did what people do when they realize that they're going to die. Uh, there was one husband on the golf course at 8.07, if you can imagine, that Saturday morning who took a video of himself, sent it to his family, said, not a thing I can do. I can't get to you. I'm just going to play until it all ends. Other people were calling, relatives, loved ones, telling them goodbye, sharing with them. Uh, for the last time, they thought uh, a message of love. But what they said was a lot of folks were calling, apologizing for things that they had done that they needed to say, I am sorry for. I've often thought to myself, what would you do if you knew that you had 38 minutes and everything in this world around you would absolutely disintegrate into a nuclear explosion. Well, the one thing that comes back to me over and over again, and in fact, I have to be honest now, I'm a Baptist preacher, but I've got to be honest with you. The thing that comes back to me time and time again is if I thought I had 38 minutes to live, what would I do? What I would do is I'd have to share Jesus Christ with somebody. And that's exactly what was on the mind of Christ days before he was crucified. If you've got a copy of God's Word, and surely you do, I want you to look with me this evening at the Gospel of Luke in the 19th chapter. Luke chapter 19. You're going to come to one of the most unusual parables that Jesus ever told. It's often confused with the parable of the talents, but don't confuse the two. Matthew 25, the parable of the talents, is totally different than what you come to in Luke chapter 19. Now, let me, let me do this quickly. Let me give you the book context. Let me give you the context of this parable in the book, in the gospel of Luke. It is, um, it, it, it is closing in on the last days of the earthly ministry of Christ, Jesus is on his way to Calvary. He's on his way to Jerusalem. He's on his way there to be crucified. He has constantly told these disciples what is coming, and they, and they never seem to catch what's going on. 
Now, let me give you the, the, the chapter context. He's in Jericho, and the chapter context is the story that you know very well. Uh, Jesus is passing through Jericho on his way up to Jerusalem, and he walks past a tree. And there is a wee little man by the name of Zacchaeus who was up a tree, and spiritually he was out on a limb. And Jesus comes by the tree and looks up at him and says, Zacchaeus, come on down because I'm going to your house and I'm going to eat today. Now, you know the story very well. This was the very reason why Pharisees hated Jesus. They hated him because he socialized with sinners. He ate with sinners. Now, we're going to go out after this service, I hope. I hope I am subliminally planting a a seed here in your pastor's mind and we're going to eat. Um, and we see that as a social event. We'll go in a restaurant and people are eating all around us. We give it no thought. You did not eat with people in Jesus's day unless you were building a relationship. It was far more than social. It was even far more than, um, fellowship. It was the implication of intimacy. We are building a deep relationship here. And that was too much for the Pharisees to ever sit down with a sinner. And yet Jesus was doing it constantly. And so he goes to the house of Zacchaeus to eat. Now you come to the conversation there in the house of Zacchaeus in verse nine and verse 10 of chapter 19 of Luke's gospel. And Jesus said to him, that is to Zacchaeus, today salvation has come to this house because he too is a son of Abraham. Now you recall to explain the phrase son of Abraham, you recall that Abraham believed in God and it was counted to him as righteous. Abraham was not saved because he followed the Lord to the land that God had promised him. Uh, It was not because of the things that he had done. It was because of the faith that he had placed in God. Recall, Jesus said, uh, your father Abraham saw my day and rejoiced. Abraham had placed his faith in God. He did not understand. He did not know. But somehow he figured out in his mind that God was going to provide a substitute for him the way God had provided a ram to substitute for Isaac. And so he placed his faith. And Jesus says, you're a true son of Abraham now. You have trusted by faith. Now look at verse 10, because Jesus gives us that verse that we're so familiar with, for the son of man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. Now that's the immediate context of what is about to take place. What Jesus is about to say, verse 11, while they were listening, now let me, let me show you. I went to Southwestern, so I got a little education, little emphasis is on little. While they were listening, that is an aorist present participle, which means they were listening and they were listening and they were listening and they were listening and they were listening. This is the discussion that is going on. They left the house of Zacchaeus. They are on their way up that road from Jericho up to Jerusalem, and they're hearing these things. They were listening to these things. All the conversation that had taken place in the house of Zacchaeus, they were listening. They were recounting it. They were talking about it. They were talking about the salvation of Zacchaeus. They were talking about the fact that the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Now look back at verse 11, because he was near Jerusalem. He knows what's going to take place. He knows what is coming, what is going to happen. He knows the craziness that is going to break out in Jerusalem. And so he's got something that is on his heart that he desperately wants to share with these disciples. They now, you've seen Jesus' thinking here. Now, look at their thinking. They suppose that the kingdom of God was to appear immediately. Let me give you just a brief little bit of Jewish eschatology. Jews believed that just suddenly the Messiah would appear in the temple. Uh, that everyone would just turn around and there the Messiah would appear in the temple. He would seize the throne of David and he would rid the country of their enemies. 
You go back to the, to the Psalm, Psalm 48, which they sang in the temple every single Sunday. They sang this. The Levitical priests would sing this as they worked, uh, as they worked. Open up the gates. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and let the king of righteousness come in. And so they believe this Psalm of David, which speaks of letting the king come in in victory. Who is this king? The Lord, the king, the Lord uh, who is strong and mighty. And so Christ, the Messiah, was going to appear in the temple, seize the throne of David, overthrow the enemies of Israel, and reestablish the Solomonic reign that was so wealthy and so wonderful for the people. Now that's what these disciples are thinking. They've got this in their head. This is going to take place. Maybe this is going to happen. Maybe he's going to get in the temple and all of a sudden we're not going to believe all the stuff that's going to happen when we get there. Jesus knows they're thinking that. He knows what's on their mind and so he's going to come and he's going to talk to them. If you look at this immediate context, the son of man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. He is going to basically say to them and say to us that the mission of Christ has been handed to us to deliver to the world. And there are two things that I want to show you and let me do this quickly. Number one, I want you to see the call to risk and invest for the sake of the gospel. It's been handed to us. This mission of Christ, when he ascended back to the Father, he's left us a mission, his mission. And that is to take this gospel to the world. And he comes now and he's going to give a parable that is basically a call to us to risk and invest our lives for the sake of the gospel. Now, I get to do something that I dearly love. I get to give you a little history. Verse 12, so he said. This is the only place in the gospels you find this parable in Luke's gospel. And Jesus takes what is basically a current event. Now, it had happened some time back, but it was basically a very well-known current event. And he's going to use that to teach them a parable. So let me read just verse 12 to you. A nobleman went to a distant country to receive a kingdom uh, for himself and then return. Now, these disciples, these Jews would have immediately understood what this event was because this had actually happened. In 40 BC, Herod, who we know as Herod the Great, had gone to Rome and Julius Caesar had crowned him king. Now, if I had an hour more to preach, I'd tell you that story. Fascinating why he does this. Uh, but I don't have that time. So he, he is crowned king. Julius Caesar crowns Herod, he calls himself the great, king of Judea. Uh, now, this is about 4 BC, Herod dies. When he dies, he has changed his will. In fact, he leaves six different wills. Now, you want to really mess your kids up? Just do that to them. Uh, right before he died, he changed and left another will. He had left Antipas, his son. He's got three sons now, uh, Archelaus, Antipas, and Philip. The other sons he had killed along with a couple of wives. Uh, it, it's the Jewish saying. The Jewish saying in that time was, it's better to be Herod's pig than his son because he would kill his sons. He wouldn't bother the pigs. Well, uh, he's got these three sons left. He had left Antipas to inherit the kingdom. Then he changed it to Archelaus. So when Herod dies, Archelaus, Antipas, and Philip are all fighting about this. They get on a ship, they go to Rome. Now it's Augustus Caesar that is ruling. Roddy McDowell is now running the empire, if you saw the movie. Uh, Roddy McDowell, not Roddy, uh, Augustus Caesar is now ruling. And these three brothers come in And if there's anything about Augustus, he is an administrative genius, and he knows I've got an issue on my hands here. Now, unknown to these three brothers, a contingency of the Jews have gotten on a ship and gone to Rome as well. 
And they've gone before Augustus Caesar and they have said this, do not make him king of the Jews. We can't handle it. We suffered through his dad and I, we will not be able to control the people if you do this. Do not let this happen. So Augustus uh, Caesar was not going to do what Archelaus wanted. So this is what he does. He gives Archelaus a portion of Judea and makes him not king of the Jews, king of Judea. He makes him the ethnarch, which means a ruler of an ethnic group. He gives Antipas Galilee and he gives Philip everything that is on the eastern side of the Jordan River. So Jesus now begins with a very familiar historical event that has just happened. And he talks about this nobleman who goes off to become a ruler and return. Now, when you look at this, Jesus is the nobleman. Verse 12, he goes to a distant country. We know and understand that he's ascended to the father. To receive a kingdom for himself, you can go to Psalm 2, you can go to Psalm 110, sit at my feet or, or sit here at my side until I make your enemies your footstool. One day God is going to give to Christ all the nations of the earth, you can read Psalm 2. And so you begin to see what's going to take place and then he's going to return. But before he goes, this nobleman does something. He calls in his slaves and he gives them a minna. Now, let me tell you, not a minnow, or if you're from South Carolina like me, a minner. It's a minna. It was a fourth of an ounce of gold. It was a third of a year's salary. And he gives it to him in verse 13, and he called 10 of his slaves and he gave them 10 minutes and he said to them, do business. Pragmatuoma, pragmatic comes from that word. Here is this one third of a year's salary. Be pragmatic, invest, trade like, um, <laughs> trade like a banker, trade like a Wall Street uh, executive. Take this and risk it and invest it. Do something with it. Now the question that everybody debates and the question that the commentators will debate is what does the minna represent? Does it represent that which is financial? I don't think so. I'll tell you that right off the top. I don't, I don't think it is. You can make a case for that when you come to the, uh, to the, uh, the, the parable of the talents back in Matthew chapter 25. But here, I don't think it is. Uh, here, the emphasis happens to be on he gives each one the same amount. We don't all have the same amount. We are, we are in life. Um, we have differences in, in socioeconomically. And so we don't all receive the same thing. That's not what he's talking about. Well, is it time? Could it be referring to time here? Well, it could be. He could be speaking of time. Uh, while we do not all have the same length of life, we all are given 24 hours in a day. It's a possibility this could be time that he gives to each one a period of time. But I really don't think that's what it is. Is it truth? Could be. That may be getting closer to it here. Uh, is he referring to the word of God? Is he referring to truth? Uh, that's very possible. We all have the same amount of truth. I don't have any more truth than you do. I may have gone to seminary. I, I may study uh, every single day the word of God. You may not. But listen, let me tell you something. I don't have any more truth than you. If you've got this in your hand, you've got as much truth as I've got. Now, what you do with it is a different issue. So that may be getting at it. Is it opportunity? Is it the fact that he gives them opportunity? We don't all have equal opportunities, but all of us have opportunities. Now, I don't, I don't think that's what it is. And you say, well, for crying out loud, will you tell us? Well, maybe in 30 minutes I might. No, uh, I'm going to tell you right now what I think it is. I think it's the gospel. 
And you say, well, why do you think it's the gospel? Because of the context. I made sense to do about that at the beginning, go back, because this was the conversation in Zacchaeus' house. Today, salvation has come to this house because he too is a son of Abraham, for the son of man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. While they were listening to these things, Jesus went on to tell this parable. He is telling the parable this, that you and I, all of us that believe on Jesus Christ have been given this one thing, and that one thing that has been placed in our hand is the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is what we have. That is what we've been given. Every single one of us. Now, just like the disciples, we don't get any more excited about it than they did. They're on their way up to Jerusalem. They've got in the back of their mind, we're going to get thrones, we're going to get seats, we're going to be a part of the government, we're going to be part of the overthrow, we're going to be part of a new system, we're going to be part of the Davidic throne. All of these things are dancing in their heads and they have ignored the fact that Jesus has told them over and over, I go to Jerusalem to be handed over to wicked men. And they don't realize, just like we don't grasp and we don't realize what it is that Christ has done for us. We don't realize what it is that Christ has placed in our hands, the gospel that he has given to us. I'll never forget what his hands look like. It's been well over 40 years ago. My first year of college up in the mountains, the Appalachian Mountains of South Carolina, my freshman year there at North Greenville, I met a young guy by the name of Randall. Randall was overweight and Randall was slow and Randall was the brunt of all the jokes around school. Everybody laughed at him. He could get so excited, but he loved Jesus, and he loved gospel music. Loved it. And everybody would kind of poke fun at him and get him wound up and get him all just hyped up until Randall would just kind of launch into a, to one of those Appalachian type of preaching styles And he would basically say, I love Jesus and I don't care if you laugh at me about it. By the way, did you notice that in this passage in verse 14? It says, but the citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him saying, we don't want this man to reign over us. You know, that's what the Jews did to to Archelaus. When Archelaus got back to Jerusalem... He slaughtered about 8,000 Jews out of his fury because they had opposed him before Caesar. Christ gives us the gospel and he says, you're going to take this into a hostile world. You're going to take the gospel into a world that's going to reject me. You're going to take this into a world. And there was Randall who was being rejected by everybody and they were rejecting the Christ that he was sharing with them. It was in January, this time of year. It was cold out, snowing up in the mountains. And Randall had asked if I could come over to his dorm room to help him study for a test. I liked Randall. I hated that everybody made fun of him. I was wrestling with a call to ministry myself. And I was watching them make fun of this preacher boy. And it was breaking my heart. And I was thinking, I'm going to surrender to the ministry. And are they going to do that to me? I went over to his room and I sat down to help him study and it was the first time that I noticed his hands. And I looked down and his hands were horribly scarred on the inside. And before I could catch myself and I regretted doing it, I said, oh, Randall, what in the world happened to your hands? And I looked up at him and a tear just formed in his eyes. 
And he began to talk very softly, and he said, Mac, I grew up in these mountains here, the mountains of Appalachia. He said, our family was very poor. He said, the only way we heated our house was with a pot belly stove. And he says, as a young boy, he said, I walked over to that stove one day when it was just as hot as it could be. And he said, I reached up for some reason and put my hands on it. And he said, it was so hot, my hands literally stuck. And he said, they had to pull my hands off. And he said, they took me to the doctor. And he said, I had one operation after another on these hands. I noticed that he had always carried his hands a little funny. But I never knew why. And Randall began to really cry at that point. And he said, do you know what my mom used to do? He said, my mom would sit in that rocking chair and she would take my hands and she'd hold them and she would pat them. And she would rub some kind of ointment on them and she would say, Randall, these are the most precious little hands I have ever seen. And as I sat in that dorm room that night, I thought to myself how my sin had left my life scarred and marred and charred and ugly and repulsive to look at. And yet God in his great love for me put Christ on a cross so that he would not just do something with the mess of my life, but that he would take away the scars and the mars and the chars of my sin and leave me looking like Jesus Christ, his son. That's what Christ has done for you. And Christ comes now and he takes that gospel and he puts that gospel in your hands. And he says, realizing what I've done for you, take this gospel into a very hostile society and risk and invest for my sake. Let me show you a second thing here. The second thing is this. And we've got a call to do that. You're called to do that. It's not just me. It's not just Steve Gaines. It's not just your pastor. We're all called to do that. To take the gospel. He's put it in our hands. But now let me tell you, we're cautioned about playing it safe in the Christian life. How many Christians do you know play it safe? Most of us. Yeah. Amen. Just sit there now. I'm going to start amen in myself. <laughs> amen. amen. Most of us play it safe. Well, now watch what happens beginning in verse 15. When he returned after receiving the kingdom, he ordered that these slaves to whom he had given the money be called to him so that he might know what business they had done. So now he comes back. And now he starts to call these slaves to himself. Now, I gave you something, and I want to know, what did you do with it? Verse 16, the first appeared saying, Master, your minna has made ten minas more. And he said to him, Well done, good slave, because you've been faithful to a very little thing. You're to be an authority over ten cities. And you see, this has got to be more than just financial stuff here, folks. What this is a reference to is the fact that one day you and I as Christians will stand before the Bema seat of Christ and there we will give an account, thank God, not for my sins, but I'm going to tell you something, we're going to give an account for how we have lived the Christian life. What did you do with what Christ has put in your hand? 
I'm not talking about financially. I'm not talking about your time. I'm not talking about opportunity. I'm talking about the fact that you know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, and you have a responsibility to share that news with somebody. You say, when a preacher, I don't know if I like that. Well, good. You, you, if I find out you don't like it, I'm going to really bear down on it. He calls the next one in. Well done, good slave. You've been faithful in a few things. You've made five minas. You're going to be over five cities. Do you know I could take you, Revelation chapter 20, John says, and I saw thrones in heaven, plural. You go back to chapter 4 where he sees the, the thrones of the 24 elders. They represent the church. You can go to uh, 2 Timothy where Paul tells Timothy, he says, we will reign if we endure. But I'm going to take you to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And let me just read something to you right there. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, Paul's dealing with the church at Corinth because they, oh Lord, they've got so many problems. But one of their problems happened to deal with lawsuits. My stars, if we need to hear anything, we probably need to hear this in America. Does any one of you, when he has a case against his neighbor, dare to go to law before the unrighteous and not before the saints? Now, he's talking about the church here. I can't get into all that. Just listen to what I'm going to tell you. Or do you not know that the saints... Now, look, who are the saints, folks? Us. Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? Do you realize what you're going to do one day? You're not going to float on a cloud and play a harp for crying out loud. There's work to be done in the kingdom that's coming. You could have all come in here with black robes on tonight. And it would have been a picture of what you're going to do one day. And that is, Paul says, we are all going to sit in judgment over the world. But not only that, please don't ever say when somebody dies, they're going to become an angel. Because for the Christian, listen, we're going to sit and judge angels. You see that? It's right here in verse 3. Now, if you look right there. We're going to judge worlds. We're going to judge angels. That's what he's talking about here. There is responsibility. There is great, great responsibility that's going to be given to the people of God in the kingdom to come. But now look at verse 20, because right here, you're going to read something I've got to show you. It says, another came saying, master, here's your amena. Do you see that little word, another, right there? There are two words in Greek for another. One is the word, alas. Another of the same kind. Now, I've just come back. Uh, We spent Christmas up in the North Carolina mountains. Uh, I've come back with, you know, some red delicious apples from up there. If I brought a red delicious apple up here and said, here's a red delicious apple, and then I pulled out another red delicious apple, and I I could say in the Greek, here is this red delicious and alas, another of the same kind. But there's another word in Greek for another, and it's the word eteros. If I had a red delicious here and a gala over here, now you can bake with a gala apple. Uh, but a red delicious apple is just for eating. This is for baking. But you'd look at me and say, no, those are apples. I'm looking at both of them. They're apples. Well, they are. You've got an apple that is a red delicious and a gala. You've got a heteros. It is an apple of a different kind. Now, what do you suppose the word is here? Is it another of the same kind or is it another of a different kind? It's eteros. It's another of a different kind. It doesn't say that he's not a slave. He is. Doesn't say that he's not a Christian. He is. Doesn't say that he abandoned the faith. It doesn't say that he went off into agnosticism. It doesn't say he became an atheist. It doesn't say anything like that. He is a slave. He is a servant, but he is a servant of another kind. 
because he comes with his minna, which he kept in a handkerchief. For I was afraid of you because you are an exacting man. Austeros. Austere. You're stern. You're so serious. You, 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 won't, you don't joke on this any little bit. And I knew you were a stern man, an exacting man, and you take up what you did not lay down, and you reap what you did not sow. And he, the nobleman, said to him, the slave, by your own words, I will judge you worthless slave. Now, let me tell you something, folks. This won't, this won't win you the fame of a congregation right here, but I'm, gonna, I'm preaching it anyway. Let me tell you something. Every single one of us sitting in this place knows what we should be doing. Every one of us, without exception, we know deep on the inside that we are to be sharing the gospel. And let me tell you something. I don't care what your eschatology is. Brothers and sisters, we're closer to the second coming of Christ today than we were yesterday. And we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. We don't know what the Iranians are going to do tonight. We don't know what the Iraqis are going to do. We don't know what the North Koreans are going to do. And if there's one thing I know about the president, we don't know what he's liable to do. We just don't know. But we do know this. We're playing at this thing called church. And we're playing at this thing called the Christian life. And we've been given the gospel. And we're just playing at it. And let me show you what happens with that. He comes and he says, why didn't you at least put my money in the bank? Verse 23, and having come, I would have collected it with interest. Then he said to the bystanders, take the men away from him and give it to one who has 10 minutes. Now, I'm going to interject something here. Verse 25, because we need to hear this as well. All of those to whom the nobleman said, go and get his men and give it to the guy who's got 10. They all chime in and they say, well, no, wait a minute. That's not fair. That, that's not, you know, that doesn't seem to be right. That, that's only going to make him feel a little worse. He's going to feel bad about that. Master, he already has 10 minutes. This guy's already got 10. Do you really want to take that? I don't know why in the world that the only place it's acceptable to be lazy and apathetic is in a Baptist church. I don't know why. You don't do your bank in that way. I know Texans good enough to know that. That if you got your money over here in bank A and it's not earning 1% interest, you're going to take it over here to bank B that's paying 7% right now. Aren't you going to do that? Sure you are. Why? Because you've got good sense business-wise. And yet in the church and with the Christian life, We'll make every excuse seem plausible as to why we don't share Jesus Christ. Well, I don't want to be embarrassed. I, you know, they're liable to ask me something I don't know how to answer. Well, I guarantee you that happens to you every day. People ask you questions you don't know how to answer all day long. Well, I don't, you know, it's, I'm kind of uncomfortable. I don't want, I don't want them to be uncomfortable. I don't, you just want them to spend eternity in hell. Just don't want them to be uncomfortable now. <laughs> you say, well, I'm uncomfortable right now. I'm telling you, you'd better get uncomfortable. Because there is a Christ in heaven who is coming back. And for every one of us that knows him as Lord and Savior, he has put in our hands the gospel. And the question is, what are we doing with it? He says, you come and take it. I tell you that everyone who has more shall be given, but from the one who does not have, even what he does shall be taken away. You see, this guy thought I can save all of myself and all of my stuff. I can save it. I won't risk it. I won't invest it. I can save it. But the Lord comes back and he says, no, he says, what you thought you saved, I'm taking away. And what you could have had, you are going to forfeit. Just listen to what is said back in Luke chapter 9. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. 
And whoever loses his life for my sake, he's the one who will save it. It is very clear to me. That's as simple as I can take a little parable and just lay it out there for you. It is a call to risk and invest the gospel of Jesus Christ every way you can possibly do it. And it is a warning of caution. You'd better not play at the Christian life. Now, do you know what all this sounds like to me? You know what all of it sounds like to me? It was a story. We don't know who wrote it, but began to circulate in 1370. And it was a story about the king who had gone away on the third crusade. His name was Richard. And Richard had gone to fight uh, Saladin and the Muslims at Acre on the coast of the Holy Land. And he had a cousin by the name of John who wanted to take control of the country. And John had muscle, and the muscle was a guy by the name, the Sheriff of Nottingham. And Richard had a knight who came back to the country whose name was Kevin Costner. (laughs) And Robin Hood took all the deacons and they were in the woods and they did everything they could to push back the darkness the sheriff of Nottingham who abused and misused and stole and did everything he could to the people. You remember that movie? You remember how it ends? 1991. I remember sitting in the movie with Debbie (laughs) at the end of that movie when Robin Hood and Maid Marian are getting married and the old friar says, Is there anyone here who has anything to say? And all of a sudden you hear this Scottish accent say, I do. And they turn around and lo and behold, this man pulls off his knight's helmet and it's Sean Connery. (laughs) And the whole place goes berserk. And he comes up and Richard has come back to take his throne. And all the men with Robin have a position of authority. Isn't that interesting? Well, let me tell you what is not a fairy tale. Is that one day the eastern sky is going to split. And there is going to be a shout and the voice of an archangel and the trump of God. And instantaneously, those of us, if we're alive, are going to be caught up together. I believe in the rapture of the church. And we're going to be caught up with the Lord in the clouds, and we're going to meet all of our loved ones who have gone on before us. And we'll give an account through that period between the rapture and the second coming of Christ with what we did with the gospel that's been given to us. Now let me tell you this and I close. The world's hungry out there. Sometime back on a Sunday night after church, I drove through a fast food restaurant. I was the only car that was there I ordered, pulled up to the window. There was a young lady standing in that window. I'll never forget. I can see it as clearly as if I'm sitting there right now. That young lady was standing in that window. I remember exactly what she looked like. And with the light behind her, she leaned out that window and she looked at me and she said this, I am standing here in this window and I wonder, is there anybody who really loves me. Now, I was stunned. 
I didn't know what she, I didn't know what to think. Nobody had ever said that to me at a fast food restaurant before. And I sat there for a moment trying to process, did this girl actually just say that? When all of a sudden the Holy Spirit spoke to my heart and said, are you going to say anything? And for the next 90 seconds, as quickly as I could, I gave that girl the gospel. And the only thing I could say, because cars now were pulling up behind me to get their order, was to trust Jesus Christ right now as your Lord and Savior. And as I was driving off, I looked back in the side view mirror, and I could hear her say as she leaned out the window, I'm trusting. 